estimated 12,500 spinal cord injuries occur in the U.S. every year, leaving the injured people, their friends, and their family to cope with the aftermath of the catastrophe. For many, navigating the challenges of the healthcare system can feel a bit like going to medical school. Suddenly you're learning a veritable cornucopia of new terms and maybe spending endless hours on Googling spinal cord anatomy. An educated patient is better equipped to advocate for his or her needs and interests. An education in spinal cord anatomy helps you understand what your doctor is saying, ask intelligent questions, and detect medical errors before they endanger your health. The basics. Though you might think of your spinal cord as one single piece, it's actually a column of nerves protected by a sheath of myelin and then further secured by 33 butterfly-shaped vertebrae. Medical providers divide the spinal cord into five distinct regions. Knowing the region in which the injury is located is often the key to understanding your diagnosis and treatment. The five spinal cord regions are the cervical spinal cord, this is the topmost portion of the spinal cord where the brain connects to the spinal cord and the neck connects to the back. This region consists of seven vertebrae, commonly referred to as C1 through C7. All spinal cord numbers are descending, so C1 is the highest vertebrae, while C7 is the lowest in this region, the thoracic spinal cord. This section forms the middle of the spinal cord containing 12 vertebrae numbered T1 through T12, the lumbar spinal cord. This is a lower region of the spinal cord where your spinal cord begins to bend. If you put your hand in your lower back where your back bends backward, you're feeling your lumbar region. There are five lumbar vertebrae numbered L1 through L5, the sacral spine. This is the lower triangle shaped region of the spine also with five vertebrae. While the lumbar spine's vertebrae bends inward, the vertebrae of the sacral region bends slightly outward. There is no actual spinal cord in this section. It is made up of nerve roots which exit the spine at their respective vertebral levels. The cossack. Commonly referred to as the tailbone, it comprises three to five separate or fused vertebrae below the sacrum. Spinal cord injury types. What is a spinal cord injury? Put simply, there are two main categories of spinal cord injuries, complete and incomplete. Complete spinal cord injuries are the most serious and occur when the spinal cord is injured, eliminating the brain's ability to send signals below the injury site. For an injury impacting the lumbar spinal cord, for example, it can lead to paralysis below the waist while preserving your motor functions in your upper body and arms. For complete injuries in the cervical spine, however, this often leads to a loss of motor function in the lower and upper body. Incomplete spinal cord injuries commonly result from compression or damage being inflicted to the spinal cord that reduces the brain's ability to send signals below the injury site. Because of the partially compromised condition of the spinal cord, incomplete injuries vary drastically from one person to another. Some sensory and motor functions may be slightly compromised or nearly eliminated in others. Additionally, some incomplete injuries result in triplegia, the loss of sensation and movement in one arm and both legs. Incomplete spinal cord injuries are increasingly common, thanks in part to better treatment and increased knowledge of how to respond and how not to respond due to improved spinal cord injury research. These injuries now account for more than 60% of spinal cord injuries, which means we're making real progress towards better treatment for SCI rehabilitation. Some of the most common types of incomplete or partial spinal cord injuries include anterior cord syndrome. This type of injury to the front of the spinal cord damages the motor and sensory pathways in the spinal cord. You may retain some sensation, but struggle with movement. Central cord syndrome. This is an injury to the center of the cord and damages nerves that carry signals from the brain to the spinal cord. Loss of fine motor skills, paralysis of the arms, and partial impairment, usually less pronounced in the legs, are common. Some survivors also suffer a loss of bowel or bladder control or lose the ability to sexually function. Brown-Saquard syndrome. 
This variety of the injury is a product of damage to one side of the spinal cord. The injury may be more pronounced on one side of the body. For instance, movement may be impossible on the right side, but may be fully retained on the left. The degree to which patients are injured greatly varies from patient to patient. Doctors assign different labels to spinal cord injuries depending upon the nature of those injuries. The most common types of spinal cord injuries include tetraplegia. These injuries, which are the result of damage to the cervical spinal cord, are typically the most severe, producing varying degrees of paralysis of all limbs. Sometimes known as quadriplegia, tetraplegia eliminates your ability to move below the site of the injury and may produce difficulties with bladder and bowel control, respiration, and other routine functions. The higher up on the cervical spinal cord the injury is, the more severe the symptoms will likely be. Paraplegia. This occurs when sensation and movement are removed from the lower half of the body, including the legs. These injuries are the product of damage to the thoracic spinal cord. As with cervical spinal cord injuries, injuries are typically more severe when they are closer to the top vertebrae. Triplegia. Triplegia causes a loss of sensation and movement in one arm and both legs, and is typically the product of an incomplete spinal cord injury. Knowing the location of your injury and whether or not the injury is complete can help you begin researching your prognosis and asking your doctors intelligent questions about your SCI rehabilitation. Spinal cord injury symptoms. A spinal cord injury is not the sort of thing you have to wonder about having. If you've suffered a spinal cord injury, your life is in danger and you'll know you're injured. Some make a miraculous recovery within months. Others need years of physical therapy and still make little to no progress. A partial list of common spinal cord injury symptoms include varying degrees of paralysis, difficulty breathing, problems with bladder and bowel function, frequent infections, bed sores, chronic pain, headaches, changes in mood or personality, loss of libido or sexual function, nerve pain, chronic muscle pain, or pneumonia, spinal cord injury diagnosis. Doctors usually decide to assess patients for spinal cord injuries based on two factors, the location and type of injury a patient has sustained and his or her symptoms. No single test can assess all spinal cord injuries. Instead, doctors rely on a variety of protocols, including clinical evaluation. Your doctor will make a detailed list of all of your symptoms and may conduct blood tests ask you to move your limbs, follow movement in your eyes, and conduct other tests to narrow down your symptoms. Imaging tests. Your doctor may order MRI imaging of other forms of radiological imaging to view your spinal column, spinal cord, and brain. Leading causes of spinal cord injuries. Most spinal cord injuries are preventable, and knowing the causes of these injuries can help you avoid becoming a victim. The National Spinal Cord Injury Statistical Center at the University of Alabama, Birmingham conducts annual spinal cord injury research, including an assortment of statistics on SCI injuries. It's interesting to note that in almost all categories of injuries, men are more likely to be injured than women. In 2014, one of the most recent years for which statistics are available, some of the leading causes of spinal cord injuries and their percentage of total number of injuries were as follows. Auto accidents, 29.3% male injuries, and 48.3% of female injuries. Falls. Falls were the second leading cause of spinal cord injuries, accounting for 22% of male injuries and 21.5% of female injuries. Gunshot wounds. Unfortunately, gun-related violence and injuries account for 16.9% of male spinal cord injuries, and 9.1% of female injuries. Diving injuries. Propelling headfirst into the water is an inherently dangerous activity. 7% of men suffered a spinal cord injury due to diving accident, while 2.1% of female divers experienced a spinal cord injury. SCI treatment. Unlike with many other injuries, the most important component of spinal cord injury treatment begins before you even get to the doctor. Remaining still, avoid moving your spinal column, and prompt emergency care can all increase the odds that you survive 
while minimizing the long-term effects of your injury. From there, doctors will focus on stabilizing you since the first hours after a spinal cord injury are critical to a patient's survival. Assistance with breathing, a collar to keep your neck still, blood transfusions, and other procedures to address your immediate symptoms may be necessary. Your doctor will work with you and your family to construct a detailed plan for your SCI rehabilitation. Every injury is different, but common treatments may include palliative care to help you be more comfortable, lifestyle changes such as a healthier diet or giving up smoking, physical therapy, family and individual counseling, and surgery as needed to correct injury-related health problems. Exercise after a spinal cord injury. Particularly in the early days after a spinal cord injury, you might be tempted to languish in bed. Moving around certainly seems counterintuitive when you suffered a catastrophic injury to your body. But the benefits of exercise don't disappear just because you've been injured. In fact, it's quite the contrary. Exercise after a spinal cord injury can expedite your SCI rehabilitation in addition to offering a myriad of other health benefits. Exercises may include yoga, water Olympics, seated aerobics, rowing, or walking. Exercise benefits include improved mental health by reducing depression and anxiety, reducing the risk of cancer, improving symptoms of chronic pain, helping to avoid chronic illness, reducing your risk of falls, and overall improving your chance of living a longer life. Spinal cord injury recovery. Your spinal cord injury rehabilitation journey can be long and often unpredictable. Some spinal cord injury sufferers spontaneously walk years after their injury. Others are never able to move again. While medical science can do a lot to predict what might happen to you, there are no guarantees when it comes to spinal cord injuries. What we do know is that a healthy lifestyle sound psychological health, family support, and receiving treatment at a model system of care can all improve outcomes. For additional information, please continue reading spinalcord.com.